be pulling your tooth, but they give us training like that. If something's more you know, serious than that, you know, we could talk to the doctor in mission control, maybe do a teleconference, and if it's something really bad, maybe we have to come back home. But that is why they put you through this really exhaustive medical exam when they select the astronaut. The idea is, let's select the healthiest people we can so that when they're in space, they're less likely to get sick up there or have a problem. That's a great question. Yeah. Uh, just out of curiosity, uh, your bowel movements change based on your diet, right? So the food that you get in the space shuttle, is the toilet designed just to handle waste material based on the food that they give you? Or <laughs> it's just designed, uh, it doesn't matter what, uh, what you're eating up there. Yeah, it's, it's not designed on, on freeze-dried food or anything like that. It doesn't matter. It, it doesn't care. <laughs> Let me show you my favorite part. One last question here. I'm probably getting ahead of you know the whole presentation or everything, but um, you've actually been to space. Um, based off of what you just saw in the presentation, is there anything that you would add or remove to make it um, more like an actual experience into space? Or you know, is this something that you, is, is this the first time you're seeing this? Or? It's the first time I've seen it. I've talked to Gary and Shay before, but the first time I saw the layout. But things like, okay, you've got science labs. Uh, when I was watching the presentation, it's like, yeah, that's like my science module, that my space lab there. And exercise is like my exercise machine, you know? Um, so it, these are the concepts that, that, yeah, they're tied in very closely to the space station or to the space shuttle mission. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I thought you did a great job when I saw that. It's like, wow, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. Um, how do they find the rocket boosters when they, do they break off? You know, like, like, do, do, do they have like some, some like beacons on it? They have beacons on them, okay. and, and they, they shoot up, and then they fall down. And okay. we know where they're going to hit. And we've got ships in that area. Not at the exact touchdown point, <laughs> splashdown point, but yeah. close. And they have beacons on them. Okay, so okay. they parachute down. Oh, and, okay. and then they send like a, like, like a signal to say, to say where, where exactly they are? Yeah, just a signal so that they can, you know, locate where they are. But they, typically they know, they can track where they're coming, they got radar they can track. Oh, okay. It's never been a mystery, you know. A lot of it they just calculate, but they have radar beacons. We, we lost one or two of these during the whole shuttle program where they sank, uh, you know, they hit the water, and your parachute didn't open and it just hit and sunk quickly. Oh. But just one or two out of the 135 missions. Let me just show you my favorite part of this picture. We didn't talk about this yet. But that's right over here. Any guess as to what that is? Those are instructions, you know. That's a cue card, we call it. Procedures for how to go to the bathroom. Does that blow your image of an astronaut or what? We have procedures for everything we do in space. Everything. I mean, the only thing we memorize, what do we do if there's a fire? Or what do you do if there's a cabin leak? Those, we don't have time for procedure, so it's instinctive. Everything else has a step-by-step -step procedure. And it sounds kind of silly or stupid having this, but on my first mission, somebody didn't follow the procedure, and they broke the toilet the first day of the mission. Ew. But no, not to worry, you know, NASA always has a backup plan. <laughs> This goes down is to use plastic bags, and that's very disgusting. Oh. <laughs> we were able to get the toilet fixed, but it really points out the importance of following procedures. And that's something you may do in, in your training modules if you have a capability during a mission for them to have procedures. That's just something we all have to learn. You know, surgeons today are going step by step by procedures, and we all do that. Yeah. So you're, you think that your pilot training, uh, learning checklists and flows helps you to be good at learning? Yeah, procedures? yeah, definitely. The checklist, you know, you're going through that for the takeoff, landing, and different phases of your flight. Uh, and also, when you're flying, you're operating complex equipment, you're multitasking, you got to fly, talk, worry about your altitude and everything else. It's, it's all really good training. Okay, we'll move on from that. And this just points out everything floats in space. It's really a great environment. If you're brushing your teeth and you want to rinse out your mouth, you can let go of your toothbrush and toothpaste. You float across the shuttle, get a little drink. When you come back, they should be right there. Can you hold it? My hands are getting kind of tired. I'll wrap it up by showing you a few pictures of the Earth. And whenever an astronaut has a free moment, we would always float to the window to watch the Earth go by. 
I've got a map in my hand here trying to figure out where we are around planet Earth. And I'm looking out one of the windows here towards the tail end of the shuttle. And I took a camera right up to that window, pressed it against the glass, and I took a picture so you can see exactly what my eyes are seeing. And this is what I get to see out that window. Oh wow. my God. So there's a beautiful blue earth. All the blue in this picture is the Pacific Ocean. The white areas here are puffy clouds. Typically these are five or six miles above the earth. And again, we're flying 200 miles up, so we're well above the atmosphere. This is Baja California coming down, looking south. This is the west coast of the mainland of Mexico. So San Diego, California, would just be in the upper right hand corner of that picture. And if you look really carefully here, right along the bottom limb of the earth, and continuing over here, you may see a little thin blue line. Can you see that? You know what that is? It's the atmosphere. On a nice sunny day like we had today, you look up at that blue sky, it looks like it goes on forever and ever. But from space, we see this edge on. And it, the atmosphere appears as this paper thin layer. It's only about 20 miles thick. That's it. And that's why when we pollute the air here on Earth, you know, it can have such a major impact on our planet. This is a tunnel going back to our science lab, you know, on my first mission. Here's a giant hurricane. Saw many storms when I was up there. This was a huge one out over the Pacific Ocean, about 400 miles across. And as we flew over the top, we went right over the top of this thing. And I'm looking out at this giant, looks like a giant whirlpool there. And as I'm looking out the window, I'm like clutching on to something inside the shuttle. Because I had the sensation that if I let go, I was going to get sucked into a giant whirlpool. <laughs> it could never happen, right? We're well above it. But it was such a huge object down below us with the spiral pattern. I had this death grip just holding on. We flew right over the eye. And from 200 miles up, I could look out the window and look straight into the eye and see the blue water of the Pacific Ocean. It was really awesome. The next picture will show you the eye looking straight down into a field. Right wow. That's about 15 miles across. And as you know, you know, you have calm winds in the center, but maybe four or seven or eight miles away, this is the eye wall. And uh, you know, this one had winds of 135 miles on this. And when you see this, that hurricane that I showed you in the previous picture, the whole thing, when you would pass over something like that, it was just awesome. You would see pitch black there, but over the storm like that, you may see 30 or 40 flashes of lightning every second. And you're watching the clouds lit up from above, you know, just the tops of the clouds there. On a bad thunderstorm here in Florida, maybe you see three or four flashes a second, but to see 30 or 40, 50 flashes every second from all this embedded lightning, it's really amazing, and it's perfectly quiet as you cruise overhead. Here's a volcano venting steam. This is in the South Pacific near Indonesia. Volcanic crater here, half underwater. These are all volcanic islands in that part of the world. And these are the Himalaya Mountains. And right here, the very center, this is Mount Everest, right here. That is the very top of Mount Everest. Now, I can stand up here in front of you tonight and tell you without lying, I have seen the top of Mount Everest with my own eyes about 25 times. <laughs> I can tell you're not impressed. <laughs> I call it the lazy man's way to see the top of Mount Everest. You know, no climbing involved, just looking out the window as I drink my tang and cruise overhead. <laughs> but I use this picture to illustrate some of the things I got to see and do during my career. I've never climbed Mount Everest and never will in my life, but I've seen the top of it many times. <clears throat> I've seen the Great Barrier Reef off Australia the Amazon rainforest in Brazil, South America. I've seen Mount Kilimanjaro, big volcanic peak poking up through the clouds. So many incredible sights around our planet. And here's a picture of a sunrise from space. Go ahead. Uh, on that note, was there any, were there any sights that you saw from up above that you felt as soon as you came back compelled to go visit in person? Many, <coughs> so many, so many sights there. You know, the Ivory Coast wow. in Africa. I just remember passing over that and you see these look like nice beaches there. It's like, wow, I gotta go visit that. You know? so, yeah. I didn't go there yet. No. <laughs> There's many places I saw that I said that, but I haven't gone there yet. The outback in Australia looked like Mars to me. You know, orange soil, red <clears throat> soil. I'm looking out the window and it's like, if somebody had blindfolded me and, and taken it off and they say, what planet? Uh oh, that's Mars. It's gotta be Mars. It just looks so beautiful so many places that I saw that I wanted to go to. Hawaii was one of them. You know, Hawaii is, you know, beautiful green islands in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. You know, you're going over blue, 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 and all of a sudden, boom, you see the islands. And I always wanted to go there. There I made it. I 
for me to go there. But there's so many places yet on my bucket list to visit. So here's a sunrise from space. And the, and the point I want to make here is because we go around the Earth every hour and a half, we get to see 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets every 24 hour day. And they're all a little different depending on volcanic dust and clouds. But again, you see how thin our atmosphere is. The limb of the Earth itself is down here where it's black. These thin, dark lines you see, those are the tops of thunderstorm clouds, maybe 10 miles above the Earth. But you see this orange red layer, that's about 10 miles. You go up another 10, 15 miles, you pretty much run out of atmosphere. Beautiful shot of Florida there. Here's the Cape, Cape Canaveral, and you see Daytona right up there. The Keys coming down. And this is at nighttime, Florida. Here's Miami. Wow. The Orlando, the Cape there. That's probably Daytona here. No, it's probably Jacksonville. 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 So maybe Daytona right there. And these lights here, are at least some of the interns working on the lights. <laughs> 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 the last working on that. Oh my God. Okay. And then at the end of the mission, it's time to come home. We fire two engines in the back of the shuttle, and it slows us down from about 18,000 miles an hour to 17,000 miles an hour. And it sounds like you're still going fast, but at that speed, gravity takes over, and you begin your fall back to Earth. It takes eight and a half minutes to get to space, and the space shuttle, it was a 55 minute return. We come down much more gently so we don't overheat and burn up. And we fire those engines halfway around the world, out over the Indian Ocean, and the shuttle would fall as we cross the Pacific, fall as we cross the United States, and we would end up landing right back here in Florida at the Kennedy Space Center. We touch down like an airplane, deploy a drag parachute, and roll to a stop at the end of the runway. And it takes them about an hour before they open the hatch and we can get out. When you first come back from space, you feel like you weigh about 2,000 pounds. But you've been floating around weightless for two weeks, and all of a sudden you come back to this pull of gravity. It's a normal pull we have in here tonight, but it felt so heavy. My arms were heavy, my legs were heavy. I was a little dizzy when I got back, and it took about a day or so for the dizziness to go away, and maybe oh, yeah. three, four days later to get your muscle strength back, and then you're pretty much back to normal. This is me here, maybe two hours after I landed on my first flight. This is Bob Cabana, who was the center director at the Kennedy Space Center. He was the commander on this flight. After we took this picture, I remember turning around and I looked up at the word Columbia. And I thought, what an amazing vehicle this is. You know, this was my house in space for two weeks. This thing protected me from the fiery reentry coming in through the atmosphere. And then one of the next thoughts that popped into my head was, uh, I'm gonna do this again. Going on one of those great rides in Orlando from Theme Park. If you've ever gone on a ride, you get off, you want to run around, get back in line, and do it again. That is exactly how I felt at this moment. Like, wow, that was incredible. I'm going to do this again and get back in line. And then I'll be able to do two, two flights. Yes. Um, oh, what does it take to take so long to go around uh, um, at, 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 like, like one planet? Like, I know that it takes like, like this many days to go around just this one planet. Why does it, why does it take why so long? Why does it take so long to go around? Well, yeah, one one planet, like 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 it's just like just like orbiting around one planet. The time that it takes you to go around a, a planet, it, it's kind of dependent on the gravity, oh. and how close you are. So the space shuttle, we're 200 miles up, and 200 miles of, above the Earth, you need to travel 18,000 miles an hour to be in an orbit. The moon is further out, a quarter of a million miles out. It's traveling at about 5,000 miles an hour. So the farther away you get, the lower that orbital speed is. So how long it takes you to get around the Earth really depends on, on your altitude. If you get lower, if we didn't have an atmosphere and you wanted to orbit the Earth, you know, just five miles up, you'd really have to go fast, you know, around the Earth, much faster than 18,000 miles an hour. Does that answer? Yeah, that's one. So that's just a little bit about living and working in space that I wanted to share with you guys tonight. I don't know if you have any other questions. Oh. We get a lot of them here. Yeah. I got a question. If I could go to Mars, would I go? If I was asked to go to Mars, I could not turn that opportunity down. Uh, I'm getting a little too old for that. You know, we're going to Mars in about 30 years or 20 years and I'll be 80 then. NASA's not going to send me to Mars. But if I was presented with that opportunity, I could not turn it down at all. I wouldn't do Mars One. I would turn that down. <laughs> <laughs> you guys know what about Mars One? Right? Yeah. Oh, God. I, I've been asked that. It's like, no. You know, people ask me, you know, 
what do you like, space better or Earth? And I gotta tell you, space is beautiful, as I've showed you, but this is where you wanna live. You know, this is where your family is, your friends are here, your favorite pizza place, right? It's <laughs> down here, there's nothing out there. So I, I could not imagine going to Mars and, and never coming back to Earth ever again. But this planet is really amazing that we live on. And I think most of the astronauts would feel that way. So if I got a chance to go to the moon, I would jump at that. Uh, I think going to Mars, I would scratch my head, yeah, I gotta go. We, were have, we happened to be on space on my last mission in July of 1997, and they just happened to land the, the lander on uh, the, the Pathfinder uh, rover, the first rover on Mars, on July 4th, you know, 1997. We were on board the space shuttle, and we did some press interviews that <coughs> afternoon. And one of the reporters asked our crew, you know, we were all in front of the camera, seven of us, and he said, you know, how many of you want to go to Mars? You know, seven of us raised our hand, you know. At the end of the press conference, you know, I'm looking around, I said, do you guys really want to go to Mars? I don't know, it's kind of far, you know. It's a long time away from home, and I'm not too wild about space food. But if you were really given that opportunity, I don't know who could turn that down, you know, because here on Earth, in our life, you know, you gotta seize those opportunities. Yeah, with all of your experience and your general knowledge, is it weird to watch science fiction movies and space movies and say, that's not how that works or something like that? Yeah, I have a, a hard time watching any of the space movies. Uh, Star like Wars. Uh -huh. you know, like, <laughs> I, I went to, my neighbors in my neighborhood wanted to see Gravity with me. Oh, um, Gravity, yeah. I went with them, and I'm sitting there with my wife, and we're, we're three seconds into the movie, and I'm nudging her, and I said, they got that far. Take it apart. So, Interstellar, I gotta say, I really liked the concept because they were exploring the idea of leaving the Earth forever. Maybe you don't come home, mm -hmm. and how do you say goodbye? I mean, it, I thought that movie was powerful from, from just that perspective. That's the part I enjoyed the most of that. But the other movies, Space Cowboys, I could list them all off. Like, ah. <laughs> yes. What about The Martian? Yeah. The Martian, I, I really liked that. I, I read the book, and, and I thought the movie, again, just the concept of being Stranded on Mars, what do you do? It, it shows the ingenuity of, of the humans, of, of our astronauts, and uh, I, I thought that I enjoyed that movie. Yeah. So no on Star Wars. <laughs> you know, I, I was never big into science fiction. A few of the astronauts love science fiction. I always liked I, I call it science reality. You know, I love watching the moon landings. I love watching the, the launches and what the astronauts are doing. And watching <laughs> You know, as we sent spacecraft past Pluto and you know, Jupiter and Saturn, I, I, I was so fascinated with that. So I watched a little bit of you know, Star Trek, things like that, but oh, okay. I was never so captivated by that. Awesome. I've taken up a lot of your time. You got time for more questions? Oh, yeah, look or at you have time. Yeah, 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 I got time. time. Yeah. I'd like to question. You do a lot of science outreach there. Has it been more difficult with the cancellation of the space program? Because now you just complete, you don't even have the carrot to dangle in front of people anymore. Well, we do, you know, we, we still, a lot of people think we don't have a space program anymore. <coughs> We've got seven astronauts up on the International Space Station today. I don't know if I got a you know, picture of that, but uh, yeah, we got six yeah, people up there right now that are living there. And, you know, this has been up there for 15 years. It'll be up there for about another nine years, I think it's, it's budgeted for. So we still have this program. We're building new generation of rockets. You know, the space launch system. This is going on right now. I work with the Marshall Space Flight Center doing outreach for them. Uh, these are the two rockets, you know, uh, Andrew and Ricardo. More powerful than the Saturn V. The Saturn V is about seven million pounds of thrust. same height as a Saturn V, but much more powerful. And with these rockets, we'll be going to the moon, to asteroids on the Mars. I show students, you know, there's our Orion capsule. You know, this is where we're headed. You know, this is just an artist <coughs> maybe going back to the moon, building a lunar base, visiting an asteroid, landing on one of the moons of Mars. Can you imagine being that person right there? And you look over your shoulder and you've got the, the red planet there. And I always show them this picture. This is one of my favorites. This one's about 20 years old already. This is an artist's drawing of the first landing on Mars. So here's our landing craft. And way later, there's two humans on Mars. 
And I used to show this picture to students all the time. And I would ask them, you know who those astronauts are? And I, it never failed. I always got one of them was me. And I'd say, well, who's the other one? They'd throw out Neil Armstrong. <laughs> yeah, was, you know, 20, 30 years from now, I'm, I'm going to be 90. They're not sending me to Mars. And, and I tell them, that's, that's them. These are your students that you're going to be coming through you know, for your training here. And it, nowadays, when I show this picture and I ask them, do you know who that is? About 90% of the time, kids will say, yeah, that's me. They get that that's them. That's a huge step from watching an astronaut talk and they assume, oh, it's gotta be them, it's not me. But nowadays they get that, that that's their future. And that's really powerful when a, when a new student can, can see themselves in that job, in that career, doing that in the future. That's really powerful, which is what you'll be working on you know, in your program. Students will leave there seeing that's what I can do, that's, that's me in the future. So we have not stopped the space program, and I tell young students, like, I am so envious of their youth, because these missions, you know, that they're gonna be doing, I went around the Earth, you know, that's all I did, around the Earth, in circles. They're going somewhere. They're really exploring out there. And the, the kids know that, the students know that. They're really excited about that exploration, I think. I've got another question just to follow up on that. As far as science outreach goes, what do you think that students should get interested in space and science and STEM the most? What is? You know, space, it's like dinosaurs. It, it's a no-brainer. Kids just like dinosaurs. Kids love space. It's a magical world. I mean, things float. You can float through the air like Superman. Kids love that kind of stuff. It's, it's a different world than, than we have down here. It's almost like science fiction. fascinating, I think, for most of the kids, to see the blob of juice on the ball. They'll giggle at that, but that is so cool. Yeah, that's, that's what happens. And here's the science behind it. Good question. Final question. <laughs> Final question. And this is more, I don't think you may not have an answer for this, but I just want to see what your opinion is. At some point, for humanity to take an exploration, there has to be a very serious international collaboration do you think we'll actually get towards something like that, a future where... Oh, the International Space Station, I was just going to put that picture back up there, but the International Space Station has, yeah, right here, is 15 different countries working on that. It, it is truly a collaborative project. Thank you very much. Um, Truly a collaborative project there. I never thought when we built the space station that all these countries could build their components and you get them to space and you put them together and they're gonna fit. When they've never tested them out here on Earth, it'll work perfectly. And even though our countries, you know, the United States and Russia has a lot of <coughs> friction right now, in space it's okay. American components, Russian components, same thing only in Taiwan. <laughs> <laughs> I, I worked in Star City for two years, and uh, when I was in Star City, there were invasions in Afghanistan, and the Gulf War was going on, and many times they were, I could sense the frustration with my government, but working together uh, on this project, there was no question, you know, we're not going to fight in space over this. They oh fight God. on the, the ground of the United Nations, maybe. How about, let me get one in the back, you know. Um, does the work uh, of the astronaut on the space station is uh, connected with his previous experience, with his previous profession, or do they teach astronauts to do something new? They, they uh, teach astronauts to do something new. So something. my background in science is crystal growth, growing metallic crystals in space, like uh, electronic materials, silicon and other materials. So I'm a trained observer. I'm a professional scientist. They would train me to study jellyfish up there. I don't know anything about jellyfish, right? <laughs> but as an observer, and if I talk to the professional scientist who, whose experiment it is, and I work with him in his lab a little bit, I know what he's looking for. And sometimes on, on some of these missions, you know, I was looking at these fires burning, and I would notice little, little side combustion things going on. And I would call it down to the ground. I said, hey, I, I don't know what is going on, but I see this. So you work 
collaboratively with, with the uh, scientists whose experiment it is, and they train us on, on different experiments. So I've worked on plant growth. That salamander that, that I showed you, the, the autolith experiment, my job on that experiment was to inject a hormone in, into like the hip area of the salamander to induce it to lay eggs so we could start that process. I'm a material scientist. I deal with metals, and to have to give a shot to a salamander, I was like, <laughs> closing my eyes as I'm doing it. But I did it 100 times, and you get comfortable. Okay, I can do that. But I realized why I'm a materials engineer and not in the medical field, because I, I didn't like that. Kind of thing. No. But they train you on, on many different things. On that end, I was just curious, like if you bring the uh, new slash salamanders back on Earth, do they have a hard time adjusting because their autolith is like bigger? Like, do they sense gravity differently? I don't know. You know, with the the bad part of being an astronaut is when we land, mm -hmm. I get off the shuttle and I, sh and I, you know, I showed you that picture, and then I'm on to my next mission. Ah. <laughs> so when the scientist collects the data, and typically it'll be three or four years later they they publish a report on oh, that. Oh, okay. So I heard that the autolith was bigger, but I didn't get all the details. That would be really interesting, though, to see, you know, how does it behave? Is it more sensitive right. you know, to gravity when it's down here? <clears throat> Thank you. So you touched on uh, astronauts from other countries uh, being uh, more prominent with more collaborative projects. I am also looking at the uh, astronaut application for NASA, and I find that it, consistent criteria is always uh, American citizenship goes with at least applying through NASA. Uh, is, would you say there's definitely an inherent advantage to being an American as far as being an astronaut? And would your recommendation be become an American or from one of the countries that, that you know, does that? Or? Not necessarily. Uh, America had, had more astronauts. Like We used to have 100 astronauts when I was in the program. Uh, you know, 100 astronauts at a time. The Russians uh, probably had like maybe 30 active astronauts at a time. And the Europeans would have maybe 15 or 20, and the Japanese, five or 10. So America had the biggest, of the, the most astronauts, the biggest astronaut office. Uh, we had access to the shuttle. We were flying more people. But there was opportunities for, for many different countries. So there's no one best country to go along with. You know, uh, it, it depends on what country you're in and you're participating in an in international program, like the space station. What options do you have to be an astronaut? Then maybe commercially, mm -hmm. you need to be fairly wealthy or buy a lottery ticket, and then you could go up, or or maybe just apply. You don't need to be an American citizen to to go up on you know to, to a commercial program to work for one of the NASA contractors, for example. So in the in the future, that, I think it's going to open up a lot more, uh, just with all the commercial space launches going on, companies to be a professional astronaut. Typically, countries pick their own, or like the Europeans pick theirs, Japanese pick theirs, Canadians select their own, and they'll have a national core of astronauts. Uh, and the Europeans have had, uh, the European Space Agency has an astronaut core, but still sometimes an Italian astronaut will fly up in the space station. That's not part of the European core, but the Italians would pay Russia to, to launch you know, their astronaut up on the space station. So. We both have national, like the Italians would have their own Italian astronauts, and some of them would be part of the European program, some not. So it's a whole mix. Yeah. I have a question. Like, really First thing I did when I came home on my first mission, you know, we landed at the Kennedy Space Center here, and I had been up maybe 20 hours by the time we landed. It was a really long day. We get back on Earth, and they, you have to see the medical doctors. And uh, you know, a couple hours later, they flew us back to Houston, and uh, we have a little welcome ceremony. And then they take us home. And I, I remember I saw my house. I could not wait to get inside the door and close the door, so that me and my family are all inside, and everybody else is outside, just to have that privacy and that quiet time. And I love my crew members dearly, but it was okay. Okay, we'll see you on Monday, you know? We had a weekend, a couple of days off, just to get away from everybody, because you spend a lot of time in close quarters. So for me, I couldn't wait to close that door, have total peace and quiet. 
and get on the phone and I, I would call up and get a double pepperoni pizza, that's my favorite, and I always did that, and then just, just crashed, you know, I'd be totally exhausted. But, you know. You're really small, you realize that, and you you realize that when you're orbiting the earth up there. Uh, so I did have that feeling that you know, it, it changed my perspective on planet Earth. Uh, my perspective, one way it changed, I, I showed you how fragile the planet is, and there's a lot of other examples I can show you how fragile and can show you what we're doing as humans. You see that from space, and every astronaut will come back and mention the atmosphere and things like that. The second way that I changed when I was in space, I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. So I'm from Cleveland, okay? I'm from the state of Ohio. That's the way I thought growing up. Now, if somebody says, where are you from? I'm from Earth, you know? And I used to be competitive with people from Cincinnati, Ohio. That's a rival city. And now, if I go in Ohio, and I'll, somebody will say, where are you from? And so I'm from Cleveland. Oh, well, I'm from Cincinnati. I don't know if I can talk to you. I think, well, this is silly, you know? We're both from Ohio. We're both from the United States. We're both from planet Earth. You know, don't you get it? So you really have this global <coughs> perspective. Whatever countries, we're from many different countries here. We're all, we're all from Earth. And that is a perspective I think that changes for all the astronauts too. You know, I don't view myself as being from Cleveland anymore. I'm from there, but I'm from Earth. And we all are, and we all have to take better care of that place. I think one of his missions was filled with all people from Ohio, except one that you got indoctrinated somehow. Yeah, <laughs> on my second mission, there was five astronauts and we had our first meeting and we kind of noticed that, oh, four of the five of us are from Ohio. That's pretty wild. And uh, I wrote to the governor of Ohio and asked, can you make this that guy who was from New York, I said, can you make him an honorary Ohioan? So they made an official proclamation. He became a, an honorary Ohioan, so we said we had the all Ohio mission. Something else happened unusual on that flight. Uh, one week before launch from the Kennedy Space Center, a woodpecker attacked our big fuel tank on the shuttle. And the, the tank is made out of aluminum. It's covered with three or four inches of foam insulation. And one woodpecker, just one, came in, started drilling a hole, got down to the aluminum, couldn't go any further, so he moved over a few inches and tried another hole. And then another and another, and it drilled 205 holes in our fuel tank. And uh, NASA had to delay our mission a month while they patched everything up. <laughs> so we became known as the All Ohio Mission and also the Woodpecker Flight. <laughs> so how am I famous? I was on the Woodpecker Flight. You know, it's kind of sad, isn't it? That this is my claim to fame. And we have some Woodpeckers. <laughs> in honor 